Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I love Baptism Sunday. It's my favorite Sunday, if you could not tell. Um, I just, there's something special, even as a person who's celebrating with the people who are making that decision, it forces me to recall what are the things that I have loved that I've seen about following Jesus and why do I still choose to do it today? And I love that about baptisms. It's like, it's like when you're at a wedding and it makes you remember why you love your spouse. And so I love it for baptisms. It makes me remember why I love Jesus. Okay, so we are in week two of a uh, two-week pause on our Matthew series. And we are talking about don't preach to me. So how do we have conversations and invitations um, that extend grace to the world around us? And I will start with a question, which is, have you, who here has prayed for someone before? Doesn't have to be like putting your hand on them. It could just be when you were on your own. Okay, don't have to put your hand up for this one, but have you ever prayed for someone who does not know Jesus to come to know Jesus? Yeah, some people have. So I have this friend um, and we became friends, we were in kindergarten together, and we became good friends, we both loved sports, um, we were very similar, so we grew up together, and we went through elementary school, middle school, high school, and we were very close, and it, I came to realize at some point that he did not know Jesus the way that I know Jesus. He did not uh, accept Jesus to be the Lord of his life. He did not know the hope and peace and joy that comes with that. And so probably around age 13 or 14, um, I was like, okay, I'm going to start praying for this friend because I want this thing for him that's really good. And so I did. And that was, you know, eighth grade. And, and on and off, I prayed for him throughout high school. But no matter how much I prayed, uh, nothing was changing. Like he, he didn't come to know Jesus. Um, and so I started to get discouraged. And has anyone ever experienced that before when you are praying for something and it feels like the answer has not come and so you start to get discouraged? And so there were two temptations um, that I experienced that maybe you have experienced as well. And the first is to my prayer doesn't change anything. So I got to a point where I was like, okay, I don't know that my prayers are really making a difference, but I bet my actions would. Like, I bet if I do something, if I just take control of this, then I can make something happen. And so I was like, I'm going to find my own way to get this person to know Jesus. On my time, I'm going to make it happen. And I did not. <laughs> um, for those of you who are basketball fans, where are my basketball fans at? Yeah, we're not really a huge basketball church, but that's okay. Did anybody stay up to watch the Lakers and Nuggets last night? I didn't because that would be irresponsible. <laughs> but, but if you ask me where I was at 11, 11, 11 p.m. last night, I also wouldn't answer that question. Um, so basketball, basketball analogy, this is like end of the game, your team's down by one, and you have God on your team, and you're like, give me the rock. I'll, put, I'll get on my back. I'm going to carry us to victory. But in prayer form, this is like this. God, this is what I am going to do. This is what you are going to do. This is how it's going to happen. And the justification of that is God doesn't want us to just sit there and not do anything, and that's true, but the underlying belief for us, the motive behind that is that God can't or won't move in response to my prayer, so really it's up to me. And so I got to a point where that was one of my temptations, and the result of that is that I inflicted my will on this person who I wanted to know God. I forced my way into trying to get him to know God. And eventually that falls apart because my will is still not as good as God's will. And so we don't come away from that then with a, an attitude of, oh my gosh, I think I may have been wrong. I come away with this attitude of, well, God must be somehow against me because I gave him a chance to come through and he didn't. But actually, I didn't give him a chance to come through. I told him how he was going to come through in my way, in my timing, for my plan. And so what we end up with when we believe that our prayers don't change anything is that the world looks a lot more like me and my internal prayer life, my connection to God crumbles inside of me at the same time. So that's temptation number one. And I would love to resolve that for you, but I'm not going to yet. We're going to jump to temptation number two. Temptation number two is that you move to something called a, what I call a pray it and forget it or a grocery list prayer. So this is like a God, you got this. Do what you want to do. So this is basketball, end of the game, your team's down by one, and you're on the bench. 
Like you want no part in the game whatsoever because you are afraid of failing. And so you have taken yourself out entirely. And the justification for this prayer is, well, I gave it to God and that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's true, but the underlying belief and the motive of it is God couldn't or wouldn't use me to show this person that he loves them. That somehow I am disqualified from being a part of God's plan in this. And so the result is you don't experience the fulfillment of the power of God in your life, the beauty of the Holy Spirit, because you have disqualified yourself from being a part of that. And so what you're left with is a cheap request with no backbone of obedience. There is no here I am, send me in that prayer. And so we have two temptations. My prayer doesn't change anything. My action does and pray it and forget it. And one results in a world where you are actively telling God what to do and what needs to happen. And the other is one where you passively disqualify yourself from being a part of changing the world. And both prayers are based in fear. One is a fear that God will not act. And one is a fear that you are not enough. And so this morning, I want to talk about a different way to think about prayer. And I'm going to call it praying like a surfer or lessons to learn from surfing. So if you're a real surfer, don't judge me. Um, we read this book this year as a church staff called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. If you know anything about our church staff, we nailed living like fools. We were, ex we were excellent in that capacity. The praying like monks part was really educational for us. Um, so the concept that I'm going to talk about, the reason I'm bringing that up is because the concept that I'm talking about comes from that book. So if you want to read it and get a better understanding of it and probably a more concise language and clearer picture, you can read that book. But some of you don't read, and so you're stuck with me. Um, so we are moving into praying like a surfer, and this is the scripture passage that I want to talk about today. This is Acts chapter 9, and it's the story of Ananias and Saul. And so a little bit of a backstory. Um, Saul is a man who is killing Christians. So at this point, Jesus has lived and died and resurrected and ascended back into heaven. And now you have this man named Saul who is killing the people who profess faith in Jesus. And then he goes to kill more people and put more people in prison who are professing faith in Jesus. And he's going to this place called Damascus. And on the way, he is met by this blinding light. And Jesus himself speaks to Saul out of this light and says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And so he has this transformational encounter, but he's left blind. And that's key for this story. He has this encounter with Jesus on the road, but he's left blind and his friends lead him to Damascus. And then like any good Netflix drama, it cuts scenes to the same time in Damascus already and introduces a new character. And so this is where we pick up with Ananias, who is a disciple, which means he's following Jesus, which means he's one of the people that Saul is trying to kill in Damascus. And it says... In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. But Ananias is no fool. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then Ananias went to the house and entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. I love the Bible. How cool is that story? So 2021, Kaylee and I took a trip to California, had the time of our lives, and one of the things that we did was sea kayaking. And when we finished sea kayaking, they gave us a coupon to come back for half off surfboard rentals. And so we thought, why not? So I had only done one brief surf lesson in the Atlantic Ocean at age 
younger, and Kaylee had, done, sur had surfed in Costa Rica. So she was a little bit of a leg up on me in this specific context. But we went back, and we got our surfboards, and we got in the water, and I learned a few things in the process of surfing that I think could be beneficial to us in prayer, as weird as it sounds, this morning. And the first thing that I learned is that I do not control the ocean. <laughs> and in fact... I would be sitting there on my surfboard, which was a large surfboard because I'm a large human, and I was sitting on my surfboard and I would turn and a wave would come and I would fall off when I was sitting on my surfboard. And it happened, I would say like four times. And Kaylee said it was way more than that. So you could choose who you believe between the two of us. But what I learned was, no matter how hard I paddle, and even if I were to stand up on my surfboard in the middle of the ocean, I do not control the current of the waves. I can't do it. And so the best thing that I could do is to turn and look at the horizon and see what wave might be coming my way. And so the first thing that I want to point to today is that prayer will give you eyes to see the current of what God is doing around you. Prayer is our way of turning to the horizon and looking for what God might already be doing. Effective prayer is not that God is some cosmic energy force to be summoned like you Star Wars fans love the force. God is not that. He is not something that you say, go and do this. God is a living being and not only that, but part of following God is trusting that his desires and his plans and his will is better and more knowledgeable and more perfect than ours. And so this is actually the start of Ananias' story, is that God's plan for Saul is different from what Ananias' plan for Saul would be. Ananias' little paddling arms would not be moving him towards the person who is killing followers of Jesus. And in fact, Ananias even tries to tell God that he thinks God missed something. But God says to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. So of course, God's intention for Saul is better than Ananias's. Of course, God has a bigger picture in mind than what Ananias has. And of course, God's plan for the person that you are praying for is bigger than the plan that you have for them. Of course, God's plan for them is better than what you would do for them. Of course, God's plans are better than ours. And so the first part of prayer is that it is in communication with God that Ananias sees a current moving that he would not have and could not have created on his own. Because Ananias did not stop Paul on the side of the road with a blinding light, but God did. And so you do not know what God is working in the heart of the person that you are praying for, but prayer is where you start to see the currents of what God is doing. So... When you are praying for someone who is not seeing God clearly, could God show you in that a different way of thinking than maybe what you have been thinking to that point? Maybe you have been looking for a way to persuade them that they are wrong and you are right. And in fact, in prayer, God shows you that what they actually need is someone to listen to them. Or maybe you've been looking for something to invite them to or some bridge between them and the grace of God. And in prayer, God will place an event or a person or a connection point in your mind. And he will say, this is the way, walk in it. But it starts with prayer. Prayer gives you eyes to see the current of what God is doing around you. Okay, so I had only, jumping back to surfing, I had only surfed once, as previously stated, in the Atlantic before going to California, but I grew up body surfing. Anybody ever body surfed before? Okay, I grew up body surfing in the Atlantic. 13-year-old me was pretty darn good at it. We got, we got a, a great, uh, I was stellar. I was a pretty stellar body surfer. And I got to a point where I could even just, I didn't even have to paddle when the wave was coming. I was this good. 13-year-old me. I would get all crouched down like it, and when the wave would come, I would turn and launch myself into it and ride that thing like Superman, and then eventually the wave like crumbles from underneath you and you drop into the sand. And I don't understand why we actually do that because it's so painful. But 13-year-old me was great at it, and I got to a point where I didn't even need to have to paddle. But when I got to California, I learned that in actual surfing, if you do not paddle to match the current of the wave that is coming, you will not ride that wave. And you can still watch it. 
and you can still see it crash, and it looks super cool, but you're not on it. And so one of my favorite quotes from that book that I mentioned earlier says this, the aim of prayer is not to get God in on what I think he should be doing, and that's what we talked about. Rather, the aim of prayer is to get us in on what God is doing and to become aware of it, and then key into this, to join it and to enjoy the fruit of participation. So here's Ananias with an opportunity to be part of what God is doing that has been revealed to him in prayer. And he's honest with God that he does not love the plan. And I don't want to miss that because you can be honest with God if he reveals something to you and you're like, I don't love that. There are times that people have asked me things before and I said, if the audible voice of God commands me to do that, I will ask him to say it again. <laughs> Ananias is honest with God, but then God reiterates the plan and the key is that Ananias gets on board with the plan. It says, then Ananias went to the house and entered it and placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me and key this so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I would be remiss if I did not include one more time that Ananias prays a prayer of blessing over his enemy at the prompting of God. Obedience is not promised to be an easy thing but it is promised to be worthwhile because the next verse says immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again and he got up and was baptized. And this is the wonderful, deep invitation of prayer in this middle voice, this praying like a surfer is that you are not a spectator. You are, you are part of the deep power and current of grace and love and redemption and restoration that God is moving on all the time. And so you don't just get to watch what God is doing around you. You get to see what God is doing through you. And eventually, I caught my first wave and I felt so much power in that moment, but it was not power from me. It was power from being attached to something that is so much bigger. And so prayer makes you aware of a current that is moving around you, but obedience is what puts you on the wave. Obedience makes you an active participant in God's restoration plan. And if you don't think that God can work through you, keep in mind that Ananias did try to tell God that he was wrong. And so he, then, then after God reiterates that to him, Ananias is obedient, and that is the key. Ananias starts in a place of communication with God and moves into a place of obedience, and through that, Saul's eyes are opened, and the Spirit of God is in him as Ananias prays that blessing. And when we pray, and when we see what God is doing, and when we choose to be obedient, even if we're scared about it, and when we invite blessing into the lives of the people that we are praying for, and when we move towards the people that God calls us to move towards, even if we don't want to, when we command blessing over their lives, when we command for them to see and for the Holy Spirit to be in them, then scales will fall from people's eyes and they will see what they could not see before. I'm actually gonna invite the worship team out and I wanna ask you a practical question, which is this. Who is the person in your life who currently has scales over their eyes? Who cannot see clearly the purpose that God has for their life? Who cannot see their own need for forgiveness at this point? Who has not accepted the grace of God that forgives them? Who is God calling you to pray for and to be obedient in his plan for? And there is a reason, church, that we chose to interrupt a year-long series on the book of Matthew to talk about this. Because prayer and evangelism and the conversations that you have with people who don't know grace matter. Prayer and listening and obedience and hope for those who do not know God yet is what we are committed to as a church for this year. We have actually been in conversations about this for months, but for months, for months. But this is our plan. This is our hope. This is what we feel God leading us towards as a church. And so this morning, I want to encourage you to take a step into that. And here's how it will work. There is a little card. It's like half of an index card in the seat back in front of you, except if you're in the front, then it's on the ground. And I want you to just reach down and grab that right now. Thank you so much. 
And then there are markers on both sides of your row. They'll be like a nice pretty brown or pink or something like that. And so here's what we're going to do. The person who you want to see them see clearly, the person who currently has scales over their eyes, write their name, first name only, on that card. And when the offering bucket comes by at the end of service, you're going to put that card in that offering bucket. And the reason that we are only putting their first name on that is because we are going to put those cards on the wall of our lobby as a reminder that this is our commitment. And we are asking you to commit to praying this prayer that we're about to pray together for this person every day for one month. Nothing after one month. And if you, if you get to that point and you want to keep praying, that's wonderful. But we're asking for a commitment of one month. And as a church, we are taking this seriously. We're going to put it on the walls of this building because we believe that God wants to see the eyes of this community opens to his grace and that he wants a restored relationship with every person who is in our community. We believe that he wants us to partner with him in that. So one person every day for a month. And one idea is I have a reminder on my phone that pops up at 9 a.m. every day. And it's one prayer request because I'm really, I can't think more than that. But I have one prayer request every day and it rotates based on what's going on. And so for this month, this is my reminder. And you can set a daily reminder. But every time you come in this building and you see that name on the wall, it will be your reminder of the commitment that we have made as a church to seeing the grace of God extended to our community. And so here's the prayer that we're committing to pray. And we'll pray it for the first time today. Um, and, I, and you can pray it on your own, but it will say, God, this person cannot see clearly. They are currently here. I want this for them. I trust that your plan is what is best for them. Give me eyes to see how you want me to be part of that and make me courageous to move towards them in grace and love. Uncover their eyes and let them see you and let them be filled with your spirit. I'm going to give you some time to write that person's name and to pray that prayer now. So I have one person every day for one month pray that prayer. And we're going to post it on social media this week so you'll be able to see it in different places. And you can change the words if you want, but commit to that person, that prayer, one month every day. And look for the current of what God is doing and how he wants you to be part of that. I'm going to invite you to stand. One of the hardest parts of surfing is that sometimes you turn and you look out at the horizon and you see nothing. And after a while of looking out at the horizon and seeing nothing, you are tempted to stop looking altogether for the current that you are no longer sure is coming. And I will not lie to you, prayer is a mystery. And the friend that I talked to you about at the beginning of this service that I started praying for when I was 14 is not in this room today. And to this point, he has not yet accepted the grace that God has for him. And it's a mystery. So prayer is a mystery, but it's also an invitation. And so long as the God of the universe is going to invite me to come honestly before him and take this person that I care so much about and lift their name up to him and ask him to move in their lives. And so long as he invites me to be a part of what he is doing in an extension of his grace and to share how faithful he has been to me. So long as he invites me into that deep, rich relationship with him, I'm going to take that invitation. And that is what I'm asking of you today as well is to take that invitation. Would you pray with me? Father, this is our commitment this morning, 
that as your voice says, who will I send? Who will go for us? We respond and say, here am I, Lord. Send me. We thank you, Father. Would you worship with us?